recording or okay cool there we go collapse is recording us now um just want to thank everyone who's showing up today for taking your time and your energy to um hopefully learn something uh and also want to take thank uh a few different people who've helped me out with this uh first of all kevin siever and dave hudson are part of why i kind of started doing this as an official research venue um, we started doing this together um, for uh, a presentation a few years ago for CLAPS, or for not CLAPS, for, um, we were trying to find a conference to present to, so we initially started presenting at Kapal. It wound up just being uh, Kevin and I who presented at Kapal last year, and we did just a joint panel on post-truth and fake news it took a little bit different spin than what this will be and i've since continued doing some of the work around it and then um ali versus lewis looked over my slides and gave me some help with that and then also really just everyone who's been an essential worker right now um our lives wouldn't be possible without them so big big deal um let's move into my screen share I always have to move a lot of things around. All right, so let's move into a slideshow. And those for who you who know me and might not know me, I am a little more informal. So if it feels informal, that's because I am more informal. Um, how do I present? I know there's a way to present in here. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we're presenting right now. Um, presenting, we're gonna be casting a critical eye on fake news literacy and post-truth pedagogies. Uh, this is something that's been bothering me for a while and I'll get to why. Um, so we're libraries, we're trusted institution, we're staffed by experts, we're full of knowledge, all those vocational, awe-inspiring, amazing narratives about us. Welcome, everything's fine. Um, but why did I, I think I drew on here. Um, but in the last four years, particularly, there's been a lot of air and ink occupied um, by this notion of fake news and post-truth because of the political environment, largely. Um, I, you know, I can tell you about what list of search results look like. And as of the searches I was doing about a year and a half ago, if you look in Lista, you got 179 results when you typed in post-truth or fake news into Lista. So that was something that was happening um, as of a year and a half. And I can imagine it's only gotten worse since then. I can show you my binder of everything I've read. It is very thick. I have it on my lap right now. Um, so lots of air and ink has been occupied by these dialogues about like, how do we deal with this situation about misinformation, disinformation, yada, yada. Um, a lot of us initially probably thought, whoa, job security. And this is where I get a little filthy because this bitch thought that that was going to lead to job security. Um, but how many of us also saw our budget slash and jobs cut as a result too, without much consideration for what that could mean. So amid all of this, we saw a lot of, um, lesson plan. Oh yeah. Someone said furloughs. Yeah. I got furloughed this summer. Um, yeah. So we saw like a lot of things happening around this. So publishing lesson plans, lib guides, books, um, and a lot of things really just exploded without much critique. And this has been happening for like the last four years. Um, and my main argument is that these pedagogies really just don't have the best interests of building an equitable and just democracy in mind or even improving social conditions. Um, and really, it limits our interest in promoting library edition agendas. It kind of dabbles in pop psychology a little bit without much meaningful engagement in structural conditions of oppression. Um, like a lot of us have been furloughed um, and we're, you know, just continuing the oppression and continuing the agendas of neoliberal universities, et cetera, without, oh, this is the bad place. So let's talk about it. Um, first thing on the Jamboard, 
posting the link again. Um, so there's a question there. What are the common tropes of fake news instruction? Um, I could tell you all the things that I've identified, but I'd like to hear it from you. And you can also post this in chat too, if you're unable to access the Jamboard because of limitations on users. Um, but if you are one of the lucky hundred, um, I hate to be that restrictive. If you're one of the lucky hundred, go ahead and chime in there over on the Jamboard. Um, deep fakes, yeah, we talk about deep fakes. Um, that's a newer one, because we didn't initially have those, but that's like a newer technology thing. Loaded language. A lot of loaded language. Left, right, bias charts. Yes, the crap test. Of course. Oh, we love alternative facts. Those charts. Ugh, yes. The library and a solution to everything. Yes, trusted sources, clickbait, media framing, authority. People that fall for fake news aren't very smart. Yes, that is a great point. That all news from mainstream media is trustworthy. Yes, let's go to the Jamboard now. Okay, let's pop over there. <coughs> to the Jamboard. Yeah, a lot of vague language about 2016. Oh, .gov and .org are all right. Nope, I get that one a lot. They're like, oh yeah, that .gov is correct. And I'm like, oh, in this reality? Um, comparing real news with fake news. Um, strategies for specifically hiding, highlighting fake sites that are let fake sites that are less common now. That one infographic that everyone posts, you know the one. Oh, should I bring it up right now? Because I think we all know the one infographic. Because it's from IFLA. This is the infographic, right? Oh, family and friends are. Um, <laughs> oh, neutrality by Craig. Thank you. I hate that thing. <laughs> um, and do we also know about the other infographic everyone always shares? This one? I call this the vomiting person. I think I got that from Kevin Sieber. Uh, yeah, this is the vomiting person. Um, and it, it costs money. Did you know that? Um, so this one, this one actually costs money to use. And if you scroll down by how much it costs, and there keep, there's pop-ups are just everywhere. They want you to invest. And the more you invest, you actually get to, um, you actually have to, the more you pay, you actually get to vote on what is, um, you actually get to vote on what is uh, more, more credible. So the more you pay, the more your vote is worth. Yeah. Um, so you get to see news nerd members. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I'm a news nerd. One dollar equals credibility. Actually, it costs more than that to have credibility. Um, let me find that. Yeah, so this is like how many votes you get. It's five dollars a month to get five votes. So that's about that. Is there a paper on truth and paywalls? Um, probably, but I haven't looked into that yet. That's f Oh, you can say the F word here. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, at least Wikipedia and The Guardian encourage a paywall. Yeah, I actually went to library school with Dave Ellenwood. We didn't plan this. Um, yeah, great job, everyone. So what are some of the potential damages? Um, <laughs> there's no chance credibility could get skewed in that system, not at all. Um, oh, moderate as trustworthy. I love that point. Um, what are some of some potential <laughs> face bomb and eye roll here? Um, what are some potential damages of relying on traditional information literacy to reinforce concepts of real and fake? And I think some of you really <coughs> hit on that. Either my cat just coughed. That was really weird. Um, to reinforce concepts of real and fake. So this is just kind of like a hypothetical question that I'm going to attempt to pick at a little bit here. So these are things that like I would say whoops, are real and fake are really culturally and so socially situated. Um, and it really, like Marion was saying, really <coughs> maintains a notion of authority. Um, and it's socially situation, situated and can really alienate students. And like someone was saying, I think it really says that it's, um, it makes students feel dumb if they accidentally find something from like a fake source, right? And there's, you know, this kind of overlying 
idea of real because real is dictated by you know these kind of all seeing um objective newsrooms which are predominantly white because white has a in our society a very strong cash value um and there's a lot of bad information like someone said that's real and back to that kind of neutrality in like shana was saying predominantly male too um plus putting you know this kind of statement on who has a claim to what's real or not really you know basically the white patriarchy white christian patriarchy has had a claim to what's real and fake for the longest time um it's karina said structural gaslighting um that can be a huge problem so in what ways does a both sides are neutrality based approach to teaching about information perpetuate injustice in society and i have got um um two examples here so um questions about obama's citizenship and now kamala harris's um are really explicitly racist but in an article about fake news by a librarian nick rochland he cited partisan ideology of for the belief um but he really shied away from this root belief which is racism so i mean we had see this like very legitimization of racism by using these kind of dog whistles of partisan beliefs um so you see some things like that of saying that you know some really by really hiding these things similarly when we treat something like provable like climate change as a debatable issue that really raises questions around factually proven climate catastrophe and makes room for bad policy and policy that disproportionately affects black and brown folks by the way so what are some of the potential problems of focusing on list-based approaches to biased and unbiased news sources? Oh, y'all are having like a great chat there. So this is a few comments on capitalism and the media. Um, as I already said, um, this is something that we talked about with the vomiting human chart, um, which costs money and like like someone was saying like people don't use checklists in real life and so we have to understand that media is run by capitalism and the way that media works has changed a lot and we we still are teaching media and especially when you look at articles about media literacy they work in this kind of old modality that assumes that journalists are still journalists are still gatekeepers um that they are watching public opinion and you know they're using these processes that you know take a single piece of info choose it transform it and morph it into digestible information however what they're doing instead is gate watching instead they're taking what people are doing in the public sphere which is social media because there used to be this kind of dominant public sphere which was more of an enlightenment idea that there was a controlled public sphere of activity which was predominantly white patriarchal society but now there is a different um now there's a different type of public sphere that's happening and that changes how the gate is controlled and so journalism is working differently and so for that i have kind of this example of um from alexandria ocasio and cortez's uh twitter or from her instagram feed from nbc news's twitter feed where this is a perfect example from um a news source uh that is agreed to be relatively neutral right or unbiased according to our media charts and um where they they take this and what they're doing is you know they're framing what happens in a very specific type of way where they're splicing the facts in a certain way and you know they're dismissing a lot of facts for brevity so they're framing this very normal process of a pre-recorded endorsement because she endorsed Bernie Sanders ahead of time. 
um, it, it's really astonishing about how she goes through this. Um, so I'm going to zoom in here. So this was her DNC speech. It was a procedural speech. Um, and it happens at every single convention, <laughs> but they made a huge deal about it as being like non-cooperative. Um, but I mean, and she does stick up for members of the press as well, um, which is really interesting too. So I think that was a really particular interesting example about how we can take these, you know, allegedly reliable media sources, but talk about them in these really specific ways. Um, and I wouldn't say that this is an anti-journalist thing. It just talks about what journalists do and what they have to answer to now because they are answering to certain kinds of things. This is for later. Um, because, and I wouldn't say, you know, we're pushing this idea that journalists are writing towns, but they have to answer to different things than what traditional media literacy is teaching. because it's about this kind of more dramatic land sh land, uh, landslide shift. So yes, you are allowed to be vexed about this. And that's a great point is that, um, you know, if we're trying to debunk conspiracy theories in a, in a one shot, that's very difficult to do. So what do you think explains some of these approaches? I'm not asking for a concrete answer. This is a, this is a, um, hypothetical rhetorical question. And that's the, that's my thesis, Jules. All the fact checking in the world won't stop fake news if the problem is how people consume it, because it's a very social problem. Um, so these are my possible joke solutions. Um, so yeah, if you even make a lot of mistakes when they're horny or we smoke too much salvia, the salvia will do you dirty. Um, so how do we start to kind of move away from some of these practices or attitudes? Because a lot of these are kind of traditionally grounding, grounded. Um, and like exactly how news hits you or how even um, social processing hits you. Because I like to think about, um, and the way Lisa's talking about it is community practices for sure. And these easy answers, because a lot of times news basically exists to confirm your social reality. So let's dig in here. So this, we're gonna go back to the Jamboard. And I'm gonna pop this up on Twitter here. Oops, let's go back. Let's go to the Jamboard. Okay. So, yeah, critical media studies for sure. That was um, some of the reading that I've been doing on this. Absolutely. Psychology, yep, I did some reading in experimental psychology. Um, anthropology, yeah, how things are culturally instituted, great idea. Political communication, ethics studies, sociology for sure. Yep, philosophy, I have read Epistem epistemology, truth, journalism, philosophy, a lot of queer theory, hell yeah. Critical race theory, absolutely. Yeah, those are great answers. Um, I would also say, um, has anyone mentioned that black feminism, womanism? Absolutely agree. Um, computer science actually has some great answers. African-American studies for sure. Disability theory, heck yeah. Labor studies, indigenous studies, art and media creation, anti-colonial theory. Yes, SEO and marketing for sure. Law, yes, law has huge applications here. Um, I've looked into law and policy, especially about um, the Internet Accountability Office, user design, a little bit for business. Yeah, because business policy affects how social media works. Um, because there is so much interplay with social media and um, standpoint theory, heck yeah. Yeah, these are great ideas. 
Ooh, named entity research. Data analytics. Yeah. So what, some of the, these are, you know, some of the things that I looked at were for sure psychology. I looked at like a lot of critical media studies, including critical race theory. Environmental studies, love it. Yes, the Jamboard is full. Um, feel free to post in the chat or even on Twitter. I have it uh, hashtagged as CLAPS2020 and um, we've got a lot going on there. Transformative Justice Works. Yeah, let's try to make room there. I like what's going on with this family circus cartoon. Um, I used to have a family circus pillowcase. So that's, that was my, all right. Let's move on to question number two. How can we re reframe the way we teach from thinking about individuals towards communities and systems? Because one of the things that I've noticed a lot is the, that the way um, information, a lot of information literacy, specifically a lot of fake news, does consider only, um, does really only consider the, um, yes, Donna Haraway. Um, yeah, the, her situated knowledge is, is one of my favorite, favorite things. Um, but the way that a lot of, especially fake news literacy is really oriented about fixing the individual. Um, I've read a lot of articles that have, you know, said that people are suffering from cognitively um, transmitted illnesses and things like that. It's really distressing. Um, so again, I'll post to Ooh, emergent strategy, love it. Oops, I did not mean to post that in there. I'll pop into the Jamboard. I did not mean to post that. Um, Jamboard, question number two. So let's think about reframe teaching from individuals towards communities and systems. Oh, I love what you're saying, Kel. That speaks to me <laughs> very much. I'm gonna pop over to the Jamboard now. Ooh, talks about who profits from controlling narrative. I'm loving that. Yeah, you can talk about even just like biases for within the state, like um, how I, you know, even just like I live in Wisconsin and, you know, there is a bias for making an old fashioned with brandy instead of whiskey. Um, oh, the controversial issues assignment always. Yeah. And I've had, um, <laughs> ditch crap, <laughs> applause for that. Um, yeah, using primary sources. <laughs> yeah, talking about um, authority and publishing, especially whose voices are heard or not heard. Ooh, dropping false neutrality. Connect information and oppression. Ooh, discuss the validity of personal narratives. Yeah, I love talking about personal narratives, especially um, in healthcare. Um, like talking about patient voices or own voices, um, because I am a health sciences librarian. So I like to really advocate for using, um, yeah, let's talk about public health.
Yeah. Um, yeah, I also, so I didn't have any instruction on, um, instruction uh, when I graduated from library school about 10 years ago either. So I was only taught reference. So I had to learn how to teach. So it was an interesting thing to learn how to teach, uh, speaking from where Callan's coming from, because yeah, it, there was a lot of crap all the way down and I'm talking about CRAAP and also crap. Um, so having to learn how to teach was a big thing that I've had to do along the way. Um, yeah, yeah, instruction just didn't happen until not very, until very recently. Oh yeah, UIUC, same, so yeah. So I'm glad it's changing, that's good to know. So that's really interesting to know. Um, let's move on to the next question. Okay. Um, so let this one's for the non-teachers out there. Uh, so let's talk about reforming practices beyond teaching. Um, what influence does collection development and classification and other things like even digital collections? Um, yeah, UWM, that's where I work, um, has some great uh, information literacy instruction going on in their program. Really got to give it up to Lindsay on that. Um, let's see here. So, uh, so let's talk about the influence of other things going on. And yes, controlled vocabulary, so misleading and wally, wild, wily. Um, so moving away from neutrality based, both sides, um, et cetera. Um, yeah, let's talk about bias in collections for real digital collections, um, even in archives. So like talking about are your archives community based or not, et cetera. So um, let's pop into the Jamboard. I'll pop that on the Twitter. And then I'll link y'all to the old jam board here. Weed, weed, weed. And that's not a commentary on drugs. Um, in case anyone wants to get up on that jam board. Ooh, changing policies of policing in libraries. Yes, that is a huge, great example about, um, yes, things about policies. Yeah, sometimes there are more than two sides. That is a huge thing. The myth of two sides is such a good point. Ooh, yes, more own voices. Yeah, so changing acquisition to include time for things beyond approval plans, time for selections, acquisitions, processing, everything. Ooh, open up the budget process for more individuals for consultation and review. Yes, useful for different purposes. I love that. Yeah, alternate classification systems that are best, less biased. There's the... Um, the native classification or library up in Vancouver. Um, I do not know how it's pronounced, but let me find that link. Um, yes, this one. My 
I got to meet one of the librarians for that last year. They do some fascinating stuff. Ooh, 70,000 books at a community college. Ooh, thank you, yes. Huawei, thank you. What else do we have on going on here? Ooh, Brian Deere system is another suggestion. Ooh, cinnamon roll suggestion. Yeah, there's a lot of great ideas in here. <laughs> yes, collaborating outside of your in your library if you can. Ooh, de landlording ebooks. I do not know how to save the chat. I oh I, I can create a file from it if you're okay with that. Ooh, OER. Oh, I love me some OER. We have been big proponents of OER at my institution. Okay. We are doing good on time. I will say that. Oh, Mary Beth, that would be wonderful if you would save the chat. Thank you. We have an official chat saver on our hands and I am very thankful for that. Okay. Let's keep moving on because this is a wonderful discussion and I want to keep having it. Um, what are some of the biggest things holding libraries back from a truly critical engagement with this topic? And things can be attitudes, myths, assumptions, policies, traditions, norms, etc. <laughs> there's some good stuff going on in here. Yeah, we cannot. Yeah, there's a lot going on here. Um, Let's go to the Jamboard. Faculty requests for crap. Devaluing of librarian labor. Yep. Restrictive canvas hierarchies. One shots. Yeah. The master will not give you a tool to dismantle his house. Whiteness. Yeah. Faculty not knowing what they want us or know how to help their students. Limited, yeah, I think that goes back to what Callan was saying about the, the crap drag. Obsession with the expert role. What did Shauna say earlier? Ooh, faculty are not comfortable with questioning the objectivity of their own disciplines, especially in the science. Ooh, faculty who want to uphold peer reviewed articles as the truth. Yeah, that is, um, oof, that's a heavy one. Ooh, lack of academic freedom. We're always observed by classroom faculty in one shots. Yes, that, that kind of heavy hand over that. I always feel that weight, um, epistemological combustion. That is a mouthful, but it's true. Assumptions that they've learned this stuff somewhere else when it's not baked into any or enough courses. I see that a lot because I teach, you know, masters and PhD students and there's a lot of assumptions that, oh, they should know this. And, um, oh yes, Detraction Watch, love it. Um, 
ooh, database sources this truth. Like, where do you go? Ooh, the digital natives myth. That's actually a big one that I touch on. And I actually have um, that baked into my original presentation because there is, especially in some of the original articles that I looked at for uh, compiling my research, there is a lot of kind of this, like, students are digital natives and they don't know, oh, do not say the BL word, please. Um, <laughs> We don't talk about BL, um, but there's a lot of negative talking students too. And I think that's a big problem that holds us back is this kind of like talking negatively about students. And I think that is really problematic. And I, I see that a lot in some of these articles about fake news instruction is that they talk negatively about students by saying that they're digital natives, but they don't know how to, you know, navigate articles. But one of the big things is that students of, you know, Gen Z's and stuff, like Zoomers, I like to call them, um, they really actually do care a lot about information. They want to dig down and find truth, but um, they want someone to help them. And there's a lot that goes into the socialization and the social reality of what they're dealing with, because so much has to do with social reality. Um, Exactly, ed tech research has thoroughly debunked this digital native myth. And they're, you know, they're struggling just as much to figure out and learn the things about being online as anyone else. HR, <laughs> do not get me started. Um, yeah, this, and like we, they have that like reinforced to them from their professors, etc. And like, I love to be a figure in their life who is not going to be like that to them, who just wants to be there to help. Yes, deficit thinking, who wants to be there to help them and say like, hey, you have ideas and you have um, legitimate abilities and skills that we can work with. Yes, I've heard about the barbarians at the gate theme. I, that was a disgusting trope. Oh yeah, vocational awe. That is a thing that definitely holds us back that like librarians are superheroes, but like telling us how to do our job because I've definitely had colleagues who are like that. And I'm sure you do too. Yeah, the capital P professionalism of reinforcing what that means. Okay, let's, oh, I don't have anything else left in here. Um, okay, so let's move on. I think that would, ooh, fighting to stay relevant. Um, and I think that that accounts for why people have clung so tightly to this idea of fake news, um, is that there is this fight to stay relevant is that oh we need to tell you that we're the experts about what's fake and what's real so we're um so we're we're the experts we're the we're the gatekeepers and that is part of what that is and i think that's huge is that there's this fight for relevancy and some people think that that's the way to do it ooh false dichotomy between content discipline and library and info lit there's so many good ideas in here. Um, I really don't have anything left um, to teach you. I feel like you've taught me today as well. And don't, don't forget Poe Buddy's Nerfect. Um, so this is a resource list. Uh, I have my original presentation uh, on here, I have a bibliography link and I have a link to these slides on here. Um, so if you wanna see some of my bibliography that I've been drawing from, I can show you a picture of my binder if for, that's always a great visual effect. Um, and also, yeah, there's the original post as well, which kind of breaks down a lot of these kind of nine nouns um, about everything because I really am obsessed with the idea that like we rely so much on nouns to do our teaching and that's where kind of this came from. 
Um, and so we'll move into Q and A too. So I like to take the Q and A. So what what's the question about the bibliography? Sorry, I can't see the whole Zoom. Um, yes, I can post the links in the chat. Um, is there any chance? Yes, it is a shared, shared Zotero library. Great question. It is exactly that. I don't know if that's the link that I have in there, but that's equate. That is indeed the link. Let me hop in here. Let me see if that's the bibliography I think it is. Is that my Zotero? No, that is not my Zotero. Um, let me go into my Zotero for you because that's a that's a better. Um, oh yeah, I'm I I have it all on Twitter. Um, if you want to keep going on. Um, have fun at your assessment meeting, Martinique. Thank you for coming in. But let me copy my Zotero here. This is very easy to share. There's my Zotero library. Oh, thank you for, um, yeah. I don't know how to present more formally because I like it makes me very uncomfortable. So I'm glad other people are not uncomfortable by it because I'm very um, <laughs> freewheeling. Uh, so there's that. And then, yeah, Ryan put the link and then, yeah, we've got, I'll put the slides link in too. So if you wanna bother people at work too. Um, do we have any questions? Keeping the Q and A in mind. I'm still not grown up, I'm pretty sure. Let me just, I'm going to stop a screen share if that's okay. Hello, Hi. can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, um, I have a question in regards to um, persuasion. Uh, I work with uh, plenty of li uh, conservative librarians. Ooh. I'm uh, speaking from the south of Alberta, Canada. So um, how do you, how do you introduce them to concepts that are not binary about truth. Uh, what what do you suggest? For example, tomorrow I will have a meeting in which we will stop using memes probably for our social media campaigns because of fear of copyright. Ooh, um, yeah. Or or like they criticize hardly constructivism within instruction. Oh so wow. How do you speak with uh, conservative librarians about these topics? Wow, that's Thanks. really difficult. Yeah, I mean I've worked in fairly conservative places. Um, and I think some of that, I think some of that has to be like, you have to, I think some of that in, involves like maybe finding your own way to use, use a little bit different terminology. So maybe um, instead, so instead of using the term like fake news, for instance, talk about, um, talking about media literacy or, um, things like that, or like talking, I think changing the language a little bit helps a little bit um, by talking about things like media literacy or talking about um, like, it, yeah, I think it just has to do with what language you use a lot of times to try to find something that's a little more accessible for the conservative audience. And that's what I've, like, I've worked in pretty conservative places too. and. Trust me, I know, I know how rough it is. Um, and I think that helps to somewhat too um, because of what loaded connotations it can be because of how difficult it can be. And someone suggested like media studies, for instance, or even something like um, just like trying to embed it in certain ways um, or trying not to use some of those fixed tropes in certain ways. So like trying to avoid, um, oh, someone's suggesting um, web literacy for student fact. I like media literacy a lot because I think it addresses some of those points and it provides a broader umbrella for addressing those points where you can talk about like what journalism does and address some of those bigger umbrella things about like 
what kinds of disciplines we can talk about and integrate into our lesson plans about how we consume and how social media works and things like that. Does that address what you're asking? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That helps. Definitely. The use okay. of language, I will, I will consider that. Yeah, I, I always think about the language and like what things are kind of trigger phrases for people. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, someone else had a question up in here. Okay. Has anyone talked about how fake news has been appropriated by the right to discredit everything? Yes, um, that's one thing that I kind of wanted to focus on too. Um, and that's like, that's one of the big things that, um, that's kind of why I want to like, I'm a little irked by the idea of fake news literacy because it can be such a trigger word um, because I don't think it's super inclusive and I think it really sets off a lot of, I mean, you're alienating people before you even get them in the room, first of all, um, because of how, how much of a, that can be for folks. Um, and also just because of the problems I laid out here is that it can be just so troubling in the first place because of how it's been weaponized by the right to mean a certain thing as well. Um, and so I think that's, a really problematic thing. Um, oh, what do you think of the media bias charge? Um, I did talk about that earlier. That's the Otero media one. I hate it. Um, it's a vomiting man and or human rather. It, it's genderless. Um, it's a vomiting human and it costs money and it's a for-profit organization. So and people have to pay money to decide what goes where on that chart. So I hate it. Okay. How do y'all feel about SIFT as an alternative? Um, you know, I looked into that. I know um, Ryan Randall's a really big fan of SIFT, so I know he can speak pretty authoritatively about that. I think it is a good alternative for people who are still looking for like something checklisty, and um, I think it's I think it works. You know, as because that's like similar to like the five moves, as I recall, or four moves, or something like that. Um, because it works well as like a heuristic that sticks in people's brains, but I'm still more of the mind that people, I'm still, I don't really teach like basic comp stuff. So that's less of a concern for me. I am still dealing with folks who are, um, working on like, I have to deal with people who are like master's level students and still thinking that like vaccines, vaccinations cause autism, um, which is you know, we're beyond that at that point. <laughs> um, so I think like at some point you have to move beyond those heuristics and just, you know, it can be problematic at, at a certain point. And I think that's a little disgusting for me um, where I think to some extent teaching these things about like, how do you find facts is a little bit of a lost cause because if you're believing, you know, blatantly factless information like blatantly conspiratorial information you're a little bit of a lost cause and because that has to do with social information and you need to understand that there is a social component to the way people understand the world and I think that needs to be understood on a deeper level and we're not doing enough to teach that and I think that's my central thesis and that's something that I really want to drive home there's no acronym for that Let's see here. Is that the guy who does the, um, is that Mike Caulfield who does the SIFT stuff? Yeah, I think what Allison's saying about using different tactics and touching on personal emotions and how that affects our biases, I think that really gets to what I am getting to is that list like personal emotional because people are very emotional about what they believe and i think that's really one thing that we have to consider um in this and i think that's a huge point that um i think often ignored okay four moves for fact checking which i think is now the sift method okay thank you for confirming that what about news guard 
I don't know what that is. I'm going to Google that right now. Sorry. If someone wants to tell me what NewsGuard is. Yeah, someone was saying SIFT works really well when you're stuck with one shots. Okay, thank you for confirming things. Friction as an instruction intervention. Oh yeah, Carol Schultow is great. Um, I am, I'm like actually a big fan of her works. Um, I really like the idea of friction as a instructional point. I think that's really good. Oh, we've got a lot of interesting opinions going on here and I like it. Okay, NewsGuard, the internet trust tool. Sorry, I'm going to have to like click all your links here. Yeah, I feel like every learn I knew about, I learn about new library related acronyms. We sure do love them, huh? Yes, we do. And that's kind of why I like really, Namisha's really getting at my like ire for <laughs> acronyms, I think. Um, because like we are obsessed with nouns and acronyms because, um, there are so many things in here. Um, I apply. You're making me Google so many things. So I feel like a browser extension like NewsGuard is using an automation tool, which I don't trust. Um, because it's not teaching, it's not getting the repetition for recognizing things. Um, and I think that would, I think that would really, yeah, I think that would just be really, I, I don't trust things like that because it's not teaching people how to look at things. and you need like more than anything you need to like i think students through good information literacy that's how students learn to, learn to consume things because i think it's about more than just media consumption it's about your social habits because more than anything social habits affect how people consume media and i don't think i'm getting that across um okay thank you sabrina yeah because pe because in the absence of like so like like social media is a huge game changer in all this because people's social connections have changed drastically right um, because that has really like you know the social sphere has changed drastically um, since since like you know it's changed the way we consume media because it's like putting things in front of us. And if someone shares something with us that they think is valid, um, that's going to affect our worldviews. So it's like, it doesn't matter what we're reading. It matters who we're talking to because our religious affiliations, our cultural affiliations, our social affiliations, those are the things that are going to affect what people consume and what validates their worldviews. Yes, it is social epistemology. Um, yeah, there was like, based on what I've said, what do you think is the responsibility of librarians to teach, talk about evaluation news and the like? This is where I calm down on a really rough ground. Um, 
I don't know that it's our responsibility to teach about evaluating the news. I think good infor I think good information literacy goes a long way. And it's going to help people. I think it would be I think especially in COVID era as a health sciences librarian, it would do more service to the public to teach people to learn to read and understand how scientific articles are are made and understood than to Um, we have two minutes, but if people want to stick around, I don't mind, but you can leave. Oh, Ramal's asking a good question. Um, I'll get to that. <laughs> um, but I think what's going on is that going back to, is it our responsibility? I think good information literacy is possibly more effective than news literacy instruction. Because of if we teach people how to do things like reading and engaging with scientific articles, we're going to avoid a lot of other things. <laughs> Sorry. Um, So I want to, um, yeah, and so like, like Amy's saying, putting things into a lower stakes context, like rather than dealing with things that are very high emotional issues, like the news and current events and controversial issues, like if we're talking about like Game of Thrones or media or things that people don't have super strong opinions about, that's going to help them develop better literacy skills and better information literacy skills, which are going to help them consume the media better, right? And it's going to change their social circle, in my opinion, because like, even if a media outlet, like say, you know, the difference between the 1992 election of Tony, or of, um, you know, even if a newspaper like the Washington, like remember when Glenn Beck endorsed Hillary Clinton? Do you think his followers really changed their vote? No. Okay, like, do you think that really matters? Like, media endorsements don't matter that much. It's because of their social circles that people stayed loyal to Trump. So, um, Anyway, I want to address Romel's question here as the last thing. Um, one question I'm wanting to prom problematize is about teaching fake news is that the main US liberal ruling class has been decentered by insurgent right wing elite who want to be the dominant power. Yes, that means it calls into question what news is. So does teaching combating fake news means librarians are fighting for the old liberal capitalist way of living? Um, I mean, I think there's a, there is kind of an argument to be made around that. So um, if I'm kind of getting this right, there is like, I'm going to pull up this kind of graphic about kind of news leadership. So if you look at like local newsrooms, um, there's been a huge consolidation effort in local newsrooms and they're disappearing. Um, so like my hometown of Kansas City, Missouri, I no longer live there, but they're their newspaper has essentially been bought out by a private equity firm. Private equity firms tend to be bought by, you know, right-leaning elites with lots of private business interests. Um, that kind of a news source has been, and this is happening throughout America, Youngstown, Ohio, Kansas City, probably a, media, a medium-sized to larger-sized city near you is probably facing the same problem in which they've been bought out by a similar kind of, um, oh, I love Green High is how to read a paper anyway. Um, how, that There's actually like a whole series. Yeah, hospitals bought out by private equity firms, breweries too. Um, for those of you paying attention to the brewery world, everything gets bought out by private equity firms, but newspapers are actually a big one that get bought out by private equity firms. And they basically get, you know, drained out for their last drops of money by, for advertising essentially. And they're not staying alive in the way that they should. 
Yeah, Gannett, huge. Um, anyway, so that's like a big part of it. And anyway, like, so if you look at something like that, it's basically tremendously bought out. So we are kind of reinforcing these norms of paying attention to like old capitalists. Like if we reinforce this idea, like, yeah, overdrive, huge. So we are reinforcing this, like if we teach like media literacy in this way of like, these are bias sources, these are unbiased sources, read your local newspaper. It does this effect of like reinforcing old crappy bastard capitalists and rewarding old crappy bastard capitalists because most i guarantee you most newspapers in america are are owned by old crappy right-wing bastard capitalists yes go to the keynote tomorrow or not tomorrow right I did not encounter Chomsky in grad school. That yeah, it's next week, next Thursday, a week from today. I'm gonna be in the woods tomorrow, which is, you know, another thing. Don't listen to me, it's fake news. Thank you, Romel. It's good seeing you all, sort of. Thank you all for your participation, it was amazing. Yeah, if you want to continue the conversation elsewhere, um, just hit me up on Twitter or whatever. You know where to find me in my dishwasher. Yes, I will drop my Twitter at Oh, there will be more baby dishwasher content to come. I believe the recording will be shared on the CLAPS website um, under my presentation uh, information. You can watch the recording later and watch me stumble over my words and figure out how to navigate the internet. The Arizona cloud. Oh my gosh, yeah, a, a babe, like check out my baby dishwasher SoundCloud. Some fresh tracks will be dropping. Oh, thank you, Brian.
Thanks, Aaron.